I'm the resurrection and the life. Jesus spoke these words at a funeral. Now, I grew up uh, in church. I mean, I grew up with chocolate bunnies. I grew up with pastel shirts. I grew up with dyed eggs. I grew up with all of those things. And all of those things are truly good ways to celebrate this holiday season, absolutely. But behind all of those things, there is a different story running, a story that is older and darker than our, tradition, than our traditions that we practice today. There's a story of sin and death that lies behind the Easter story, the story that reminds us of the necessity of Christ's arrival and Christ's resurrection from the dead. We are literally living in a land of death. We, we have death all around us. And, and the world that we occupy is so full of those symbols of death and decay that we almost get numb to it. But the joy we experience at Easter time is proportional to the, the just an enviable sorrow that we experience over the various ways that we see death seeming to reign here in our midst. All that lives must die, Shakespeare wrote passing from nature to eternity. And we really do live in a world that experiences that daily. Easter is the stuff of funerals. Easter is the stuff of nursing homes. Easter is the stuff of oncology reports. And Easter is the stuff of the empty chair from the loved one that we don't have here anymore. Easter is about all of those things, and the reason that we celebrate this holiday is because Jesus came to transform all of that, to defeat the, the last enemy of death and to change all of that. And if we do not have Easter, if we do not have that hope of Christ's resurrection, then what have we? Our greatest of hopes is that our death would in some way mean something. I just finished reading this really interesting social history of death. Really uplifting reading, by the way. It's good bedtime reading. But, but the author talked about how in medical schools, um, you can donate your body to science and you can have medical students practice various medical procedures on a deceased body. And, and in so doing, that life, that material form can have 
meaning beyond the grave. It can have meaning to a set of students who can then use that knowledge to hopefully save and improve lives. And the author of this book talked about how after they are finished their semester and their coursework, they actually have a funeral service for all of their uh, patients, so to speak. And, and you, you think they would be sarcastic or, or in some way mocking or, or maybe some joviality, but he said it was a very somber affair because they spoke very reverently of their patient. They learned as much as they could about their patient so that they could give sort of these mini eulogies of their patients that they had been practicing on all semester. And one student in particular mentioned that, that she would never forget her patient, so to speak, that whenever she would heal another heart, she would remember his heart. Whenever she would set a broken bone, she would remember his bone. Death without resurrection seems, we, we struggle to find meaning, we struggle to find purpose behind it. We struggle to even understand what it is that, that is death, the, the separation seemingly of our immaterial and material beings. We, we don't seem to wrap our minds around this whole subject of death. And that's why Jesus stands here in a funeral and says the most absurd thing in the world, that he is the resurrection and the life. If you're familiar with the Gospel of John, you know that John's biography is filled with all these various signs that point ultimately to who Jesus truly is and his divine nature. And all along, we've been seeing Jesus sort of encountering these different people and revealing himself in these various ways. And when we get to the, the sign here with his friend Lazarus, we find something just altogether different and something that, that points to a, a much greater reality than some of the previous signs had pointed. If you have your Bibles, Turn with me to John chapter 11, and you may not have brought them this morning when you're getting your kids out the door. That's fine. We'll have the verses on the screen. But you're undoubtedly familiar with the story of Lazarus. Jesus hears of his friend Lazarus' sickness. Then he intentionally delays coming. So when he finally gets there, he comes not to a candlelit vigil. He, he doesn't come to a sick person's bedside. He comes to a funeral. And it says in verse 17 of chapter 11 here in John, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. See, Jesus is already aware that, that Martha, and, and as well as many of these first century peoples, they all had a sort of their own understanding of what resurrection was supposed to be like. Even in the Old Testament, we find this, they're, they're haunted. The writers of the Old Testament are just haunted by the specter of death. The person Job, he, he writes in chapter 14, Man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. He comes out like a flower and withers. He flees like a shadow and continues not. Jumping down, he says, If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service I would wait till my renewal should come. It echoes the story we've been hearing since childhood, some of us, the story of Genesis, the story of our, our great ancestors who rebelled against God, and as a result, death came into the world. And so we read that you are dust, God says, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Each of us lives in that, that in-between, from birth, from cradle, to the time that we will experience that, that turning back into dust, and ever since that ancient story, we've lived in a world that moved from the majesty of the garden to the trage tragedy of the grave. And ever since then, we've lived between that from garden to grave and lived with this, the, the, the ache of knowing the fleetingness of life and knowing that, that what lies before us is an endlessly open void. Job offers just a glimpse of hope here in chapter 19. He says that, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. 
that, that same sentence is echoed later by several other prophetic writers. They, one says, after two days he will revive us, on the third day he will raise us up that we may live before him. I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol, that is the grave. I shall redeem them from death. Isaiah speaks of God swallowing up death forever. Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You will, who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. All of these passages kind of form the backdrop of what the ancient peoples would have expected surrounding the whole idea of, of death. And Martha and other relatives there at that funeral for Lazarus would have come from that background and would have shared an expectation that yes, the resurrection is possible, but it will be for all people at the end of history. And if that's true, what good is that knowledge now? And some of you, I suspect, if you're in this room, have probably had some kind of religious background in your past. Maybe you grew up in church or Sunday school, but for some reason, for whatever reason it may be, your own circumstances, just the things around you, whatever, you don't feel like the, the training or religious education you got as a child has prepared you for the brute realities of living in a land of death, the land that has gone from the garden to the grave. And you struggle I mean, you struggle to understand how the pastel colors and Easter grass and chocolates of this holiday can have a meaningful impact on you as you live your daily experience. And that's where Jesus comes in and he says, again, the most bizarre things. Jesus said to her, this is chapter 11 here back in John, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, and, and hear her response. She said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. She doesn't really answer his question, not directly. Her answer doesn't really include the whole idea of resurrection and life. He just affirms who his title more than anything else. But what Jesus is, seems to be saying is he says, listen, there, there are many, many things, particularly in the first century funeral customs, the weeping and wailing, there are many things that attract your attention, that will distract you. And Jesus comes and says, basically, listen, don't look at those things, look at me. Gaze upon me, as the, as the video indicated to us, exhorted us to do. Look at me. Don't look at the specter of death. Don't look at all these symbols of tragedy. Look at me and remember what it is that I've come into this world to do. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes that, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Paul is saying that for those who trust in Jesus, the reverse can be, can be true, that even though we've gone from the garden to the grave, there might be a possibility that somehow, some way, that could be reversed. John 11 says this, Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they might believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. The entire funeral would have had no trouble believing Jesus, as we just mentioned, in the whole idea of the resurrection at the end of human history. But the idea of someone being raised from the dead right there in the middle of human history, in the middle of his own funeral, would have been absurd. And so Jesus' sign here, his miracle, his, his performance here, it, it's, it's designed to, to catch our attention and point us to the fact that maybe, maybe through Jesus, there really can be that great reversal. That if, if one person in the center of history can be raised from the dead, maybe there really is hope for all of us. Maybe this whole resurrection story isn't, isn't so uh, far-fetched after all. 
maybe Jesus' miracle shows us that if we go from the garden to the grave, maybe there's hope that we can go from the grave to the garden. This is what they felt like when it happened. And today, it's how we should feel too. Because what it meant for them, it means for us. He saw him alive. How could it be? That guy was as dead as dead could be. There just couldn't be any possibility of a mistake. He had touched and felt the cold, dead corpse. He had, several others had removed the already stiffening form from the position in which it had died. They had helped bury the lifeless man and had stood with others at the completed grave. But now recently, he had caught several glimpses of the one he had previously buried. He, you know, he attempted to write it off as some sort of psychological trick of the mind. The dead men just don't show up after a while. But something undeniable was happening. Soon after, a moment came when he was surrounded by evil men who threatened to kill him. And there, the undeniable form of the deceased one appeared, and by the thunder of his voice and the undeniable gravity of his presence, he scattered those wicked men and sent them fleeing. It was clearly him. He was alive, but how could it be? But yes, it was he who had been buried. It was Curly. Curly. He was back from the dead to rescue Mitch, that is Billy Crystal, and his city slickers, brother and friend. No, even Hollywood could not credibly pull off a resurrection from the dead. The storyline in City Slickers 2, the legend of Curly's gold, required Curly, who had been buried in the prequel, to have a twin brother, you see who made a sequel possible so that they could have the same endearing, crusty, beloved character in the movie. And it's because dead people just don't rise again. Hollywood had a fashion, a different storyline. But, you know, we can relate, can't we, to Curly's struggle in City Slickers too, to believe against the facts of reality that a dead person was somehow alive again. And such was the struggle of the contemporaries of Jesus Christ, particularly the 11 remaining disciples, as they struggle to come to, get, come, come to grips with the reality of his resurrection. I want to look for just a couple of moments at their struggle. It's in Luke in chapter 24. The background of this is that the travelers on the road to Emmaus, you were here the other night, you met them in the back room back here. They looked a lot like um, Greg Howe. All right. And uh, they, op they were traveling with Jesus. He reveals himself. Their minds are open to see who it is, that it is he himself. And they go to report to the 11 disciples what they had seen and heard. 
And the two women, remember the two women who went to the grave with spices and found it empty and so on, they had previously reported to the eleven, but the disciples had written them off as kind of a bit little, a little bit crazy from what they were saying. And so the disciples were terribly confused about all that was going on around them and these reports that were filtering into them. Imagine their struggle. There is Peter who had three times denied Jesus Christ. And we can be critical of that, but as I always say, remember, he was close enough to do something like deny Christ. Where were the rest of them? They're off hiding somewhere. So all of them were dealing surely with some measure of shame and, and failure in their lives. And uh, only a week before, you understand their confusion, a week before they had come into Jerusalem, they had seen them, the crowds cheering and welcoming him as a king. Now he was dead, he was gone. Now there are these reports. It's all terribly confusing. But Christ's resurrection, I believe, does three things. It did it for the disciples. It can do it for us. The first thing that it did for the disciples is it gave reality to their present struggle. Luke 24, verses 36 to 43, it says, While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And they were startled and frightened, thinking they had... They saw a ghost, and they said, he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Imagine the emotions here of the 11 disciples wanting to believe what was clearly a truth in front of them, yet struggling to believe it. They had been amazed by the things that they had seen over the past three years of wandering the countryside with this man, but this was a twist and a turn of a story that they could have never imagined. It was real. It was all now coming into focus as to what had happened in their lives and in their experience in the recent days. So his resurrection gave a reality to their present struggle. But secondly, Christ's resurrection also gave explanation to their past experience and knowledge. In verses 44 to 47 here. Now, being good Jewish men who had likely been reared in the intense teachings of the synagogue system, along with all the teachings that they had heard and traveling with Jesus, there was a great deal about the ancient writings of the prophets and so on that they struggled to find and understand and make complete sense out of. In fact, we read later in the, the New Testament in Peter's writings of how he talks about how these prophets of old, even they themselves writing it, did not know and understand what it was that they were writing about. They wished they could, but they couldn't. So all of these things had a bit of fuzz and haze about them. And... Uh, now all of this was coming into focus for them, their past experience through the resurrection of Christ. The verses say, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. These major sections of the Old Testament scriptures, as we know them as the Old Testament, in all these sections, there were verses that anticipated a Messiah, verses that were very foggy in the understanding of anyone up until, but the resurrection, and that then makes it all clear. Moses had written in Deuteronomy 18, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among you from among your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. In the prophets, in Isaiah, for example, we're familiar with those famous verses in Isaiah 53 about how he was despised and rejected, how he took our pain and bore our suffering, uh, pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds uh, we are healed. And again, then in the Psalms, for example, in Psalm 16, uh, it says, you will not abandon me to the realm of dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. This is looking forward to Jesus, but people wouldn't understand exactly what this psalm was talking about until this experience happened for them. In Psalm 22, of course, we have a psalm that pictures the whole experience of the cross being poured out and so on, of those who encircle the piercing of hands and feet, bones on display, people stare and gloat over me, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. And then verse 45, he says to them, 
Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Many truths had been given them and taught them. But it takes, honestly, a work of God for truths that are heard to be understood and comprehended fully in the mind. And that was what was now happening as Christ made it possible for them to understand not just their immediate experience, but understand all that had preceded that had come to that point in their life and the scriptures, their teachings, and so on. It was all now making sense. So it gave explanation to their present, to their past, but also it informed their future. Christ's resurrection gave purpose for their future lives. The final two verses here, 48 and 49. You know, surely the disciples found themselves sitting around those first few days wondering what was coming next in their lives. For example, how much danger might they themselves be in? Three intense years of wandering the countrysides with Jesus now looked a bit wasted, perhaps, because their leader was gone. There was no one to follow. What was their purpose to continue on? But the resurrection changes this completely, and it gives them a vision and a purpose for the future. The passage says, you are my witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. That's the Holy Spirit, of course. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. You see, their lives are now changed and redefined. They have a new future. They have a new purpose. They have a story to tell, and they have a commission to tell that story. But this is not something they're supposed to do in their own strength. They're supposed to wait until they are empowered with this message. And we know that empowerment comes at the time of the day of Pentecost some weeks later with the coming of the Spirit that particularly marks this age that we continue yet to live in that we know as the age of the church of Jesus Christ, the distinctive mark of it being the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers. You know, as we plan services and we think of creative elements, we live in a wonderful age where there's so many creative resources out there. Along the lines of the two videos that we have included in our Resurrection Day celebration today. And it's always remarkable to me as I look and plan and download and, and, and prepare a service, how many of them have some sort of line in it where it says, the resurrection changes everything. Well, you can find about a dozen videos with that line in it. But you know why? Because it's actually very, very true. It's a good summary statement. The resurrection changes everything. I mean, imagine human history without the resurrection. And this truth, it's simply meaningless. A mere existence that's no more unique or higher than really just an advanced existence of a mere animal existence is the highest uh, of the animal peep creatures, you know. But the grand story that is at the center of history is centered around the person of Christ who comes to correct the error of sin and evil and to give life a purposeful life here and an eternal life there that changes everything indeed Christ changes everything and the resurrection is the grand proof that it is all changed so the resurrection story is not merely something that has changed life for the contemporaries of Jesus and his disciple, uh, 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 Jesus' disciples and the people of that era and that generation. No, indeed, the resurrection is something that gives reality to our present struggle in this world. It gives explanation for our past experiences and all of history preceding us, and it gives us purpose for our future lives and an understanding of all that is to come just as the resurrection brought focus to the disciples about what was happening around them, how it fit in with what was before them and what's to come, it does the same for us. For we now see the big picture. We understand that sin has made a mess of things. And we experience, experience that mess with our own physical frailties. And by seeing the broken condition of the world around us, of wars and conflicts and rumors of more of the same, life problems that never seem to really end, no matter how much science advances and the things that are honored by this world as that which marks greatness. 
Hey, remember Curly and the story, his great line, his one great line about how, what is life about, he said, in City Slickers? It's about finding the one thing. And that's actually pretty good theology, though Curly wasn't thinking of theology when he said you've got to find the one thing. But here's what the one thing is. The one thing is the gospel. It is this message that we celebrate today with the resurrection. And the person of the gospel is Jesus. And the life-giving guarantee of the gospel is the resurrection. And when you come to trust in this and accept this in your life, you have found the one thing. The one thing that gives perspective to your present situation, the mixed bag of life, of its good and happy gifts, yet also its challenges and difficulties and sadnesses that we all experience. Because we understand that we're still creatures prone to sin and living in a fallen, sinful world. So it gives us perspective on the day. It gives us perspective on what has been before us, past, and history that has led today to today. You understand the flow of history, seeing how it has affected you, how it has affected your family of origin. You understand what Chris earlier called the older, darker story beneath it all. And how it is indeed true that now Easter is the stuff, yes, of funerals and oncology reports, of all that promises, as we said thirdly, a future. You have a guarantee of eternal life, of a resource for the current life that we live here, a resource now, but a guarantee of eternal life and a purpose for living now that is bigger than just animal survival, which is all the world out there really has. You're not just living for yourself anymore to make it through, but rather you're serving the one who has saved you, who has helped you by the gospel, by the proof of the resurrection to understand the big picture, what it's all about, that you are called to have a part in it. You have a purpose in life and a salvation in this life that the rest of the world does not have and sadly does not understand, but which you can take to them by the power of the Spirit. Yes, the resurrection changes everything. It gives new shape to everything. The question today is, have you trusted in this? Have you come to know Christ? We have the story of how it went from the garden to the grave. Now we can go from the grave to the garden, but beyond the garden to a city, to an eternal city that's been prepared for us. We are pilgrims on the way to that. If you have trusted in Christ, have you done that? Have you come to know him? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the great gift that we have, the resurrection that changes it all. Today, as some might be with us today who have never trusted, I pray right now that they may pray these kinds of words to you. If you'd like to trust in Christ today, you may pray in this way. Uh, Father, I know I have sinned. I believe that this story is true. I believe that you have died for me. I trust in you. I trust in the resurrection. I ask that you give me new life and a new purpose to live. Father, thank you for this great truth. We all pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. This is so